So we are undoubtedly in the age of superhero movies. Sure, we've had superhero movies since, you know, the 1930s and 40s, but the ones coming at now are pretty much the creme de la creme. And while there are some independent superheroes like, you know, Hellboy, Bloodshot, the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe tend to be the, call it, uh, you know, big elephants in the room, I guess, or for lack of a better word. And while the Marvel Universe has had, for the most part, 100% batting average on hits, the DC movies have been hit or miss, to say the least. And this is not at all because the characters in the DC Universe aren't as cool as the Marvel characters. And I'm not here to zero in on one reason why DC characters haven't worked or another. And I do have some personal experience on this. Uh... And uh, by the way, as a quick introduction, this is Scott Toyguru Nightlick. I was, or am, in the toy industry. I've been in for 20 years. And a role I used to have I, when I worked for Mattel, I was the brand manager for the Green Lantern movie toy line that Mattel put out. Uh, I also did some work on The Dark Knight and Superman Rises. So, uh, not Superman Rises, Superman Returns. So... I definitely have some experience working on superhero toy lines. In this case, we're talking about a toy line where the movie, uh, you know, didn't go on to become a giant smash hit. But the toy line, I have to say, was amazing. And I'm not just saying that because I worked on it. I mean, I was just the brand manager. It was really the designers, the packaging designers and the toy designers that did all the hard work and that made this so good. They're the ones who deserve the credit. Not only was the toy line full of amazing aliens and awesome, you know, glowing green weapons, but it had, you know, collector toys, it had kid toys, it had role play toys, it had a little bit of everything. It had, you know, signature suits and signature superhero emblems on the chest, everything you would think would add up to huge success in the toy aisle. Even, you know, a signature weapon, the ring. Uh, for Green Lantern, which is the source of his power, projects all of his constructs, if I'm not getting too nerdy for mainstream audiences. But regardless of how great the toy line was, because the movie did not meet expectations from a box office standpoint, it meant that the toy line wasn't going to as well. The toy line are directly tied into the box office. And working on this movie, as well as some of the other DC movies, and as a fan of superhero movies in general, it really got me thinking. Now, Warner Brothers has a new Batman film coming out that's in the works. I know all of the movies right now have been held up because of the 2020 COVID situation. But uh, there's still, you know, there's, there are still, there's a Wonder Woman movie uh, and, and uh, the Batman movie in the works. And Batman is one of those characters that really works from a toy standpoint as far as movies. Because he has things like not only a signature suit, but he's got gadgets. He's got a car. He's got a, a jet or a helicopter. I don't think he's used a helicopter in the movies, but he's used a jet a few times. And all of these things translate very well to toys, what we call having toyetic qualities. And with that in mind, Batman has obviously been done a lot. There have been a lot of Batman movies. And while he works really well from a toy standpoint, there are a lot of hidden gems in the DC Universe that as a former brand manager of a DC movie line, I feel if I was in charge of Hollywood, or maybe one day I will be, there's definitely some properties that I would greenlight, that I would push to be uh, movies almost simply because they make such great toys. So scanning the entire DC universe specifically, and I might make a future video on other IP, but this one's just on the DC universe, there are some definite cherry pick properties that... I think have very Toyota qualities and would make amazing films, but more importantly from the toy industry, would sell great product to kids and collectors. So let's take a look. The first up on my personal list is The Metal Men. And most of you out there in mainstream America are probably like, who the heck are The Metal Men? I mean, I know Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman, maybe Green Lantern. So The Metal Men are a group of robots created by uh, Dr. Magnus, and each robot is made of an element, like gold, lead, tin, copper, mercury, etc., etc. And they each have a signature color, they each have the element's logo on their chest, 
And they all have, I guess, what you could call morphing abilities, meaning they can change form. So here you can see a good example of that from the comics, where the characters can not only alter their form based on their metallic composition, but they can even combine, like you see two of the characters doing there. Uh, you know, you see gold and you see mercury stretching, you see lead and silver combining. So the inherent metal alloys that they're made of, these robots, allow them to combine with each other, change their form, create, you know, if you will, like kind of weapons out of their hands. And they have made great toys in the past. There have been some fantastic action figures of the Metal Men. This was a set that I got to work on at Mattel in the DC Universe Classics series. These are some uh, fan-made Lego figures of what the characters could uh, hypothetically look like as Legos. But again, very, very toyetic. This is another Metal Man figure that Mattel put out, and you could see the way the arms can create weapons, which are very, very toyetic. Clamps you know, clubs, giant scissors, things that just work really well from a toy perspective. And when viewing potential movies, potential properties to exploit as a movie, thinking of which ones will make good toys is really the secret to success. I mean, the Metal Men can even become vehicles. You can imagine, you know, the characters becoming something like Lightning McQueen with eyes and, you know, etc. They also have that great color identity, which works so well for toys. And you'll see this across so many toy lines, especially boy toy lines, where all of the heroes have a signature color, i.e. just look at something like Power Rangers, where you've got the Red Ranger and the Green Ranger and the Blue Ranger and Pink Ranger, Black Ranger. Everyone has one color that symbolizes who they are. Ninja Turtles also do a great job with this. This was one way they changed the turtles and made them more kid-friendly instead of having all red like the original comic book. They each got a signature color. All right, next up on my list is Plastic Man. Again, for mainstream America, you may be like, who in the world is Plastic Man? Well, he's been around a long time. He's a Golden Age hero, and he basically has super, super stretchy abilities. If you know the Fantastic Four, if you've seen those movies, Mr. Fantastic has the same powers as Plastic Man. Although Plastic Man tends to be able to form kind of more shapes, like here you can see him forming a ladder. Uh, Mr. Fantastic more just stretches. But uh, Plastic Man tends to be able to create his body to actually form uh, you know, different, more comp complicated shapes based on what he needs to do. He's also changed very, very little over the years. He's basically in a red suit with his chest open a little bit and a yellow belt. It's been his look since day one. So turning him into a movie character, there's very clearly a definitive look to go for. You don't have to sort of choose an era because Plastic Man is Plastic Man. And when you're talking about a character that works as a toy and a kid's toy, wow, he has got it going on. I mean, he literally makes himself into toys. He could basically be anything. He could you know, be a bubble popper or a jack-in-the-box or turn himself into an airplane. He's also cartoony, if you will. He's kind of like a Looney Tune or maybe kind of like Freakazoid would be a good way of putting it. You know, he can use his body to capture bad guys by putting them in a cage made of his body, by forming that out of kind of the rubber of his body. He also has a great backstory where he's a redeemed criminal. So there's a nice sort of story arc that's very simple to understand and, uh, you know, would translate well from comic book to screen. And of course, as an elastic-based character, he, a stretchy toy, is basically a no-brainer. Um, you know, he, and it's been done. They, they've made stretchy toys of him, which is essentially not only his main power, but is a fundamental uh, you know, toy play pattern is to stretch things. And of course, there's no limit to doing adult collector action figures as well. This is one that I actually got to work on for San Diego Comic-Con 2010, 2009. Uh, sorry, the years kind of blend. But, you know, you could see with snap-on parts, you could do all sorts of kind of stretchy features that work for collectors who just like to pose him. And for kids... Again, you've got so many different variations of what his hands can do, the way he can stretch, things that he can form, that you could make role-play toys out of him, or vehicles. You could make a car that is him, or, a, or an airplane, or a tank. 
um, you know, he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a hero, he's an action figure that also could become a vehicle. And of course, as I mentioned, stretchability, we're basically talking about Stretch Armstrong as a movie, as a superhero. And while Stretch Armstrong doesn't really have a story behind him, I mean, he does have a little bit of one, Plastic Man with a story would work so well for this feature. All right, next up on my personal list, if I controlled Hollywood, when I control Hollywood, Booster Gold, another uh, DC character that's not as well known. So again, you know, mainstream public. Who the heck is Booster Gold? So Booster Gold is a fig, uh, figure, a character who was created in the mid '80s. Uh, his backstory is he's basically a failed janitor from the future who travels back in time with technology from his era, including a ring that lets him fly and a suit that gives him superpowers. Uh, and using this technology in our time, he becomes a superhero. And he does it one because he was kind of a failure in his time, but two. He's got a huge ego, and he wanted to be a star. Plus, he's got a robot buddy you see floating above him. And anyone who's got a flying robot buddy makes a great toy. So here you have a character who wants to be a superstar. What a great concept for a movie. So Booster Gold's been done as toys, obviously. You know, here's a few of them. Some of them I've had the uh, privilege of working on. Some of them not, but I'm also I'm still a big fan of his. And he, he's instantly recognizable as a superhero, but as part of his story, he's all about merchandising himself. So in the actual comics, you see things like Booster Gold Pez and Booster Gold Toothpaste and Booster Gold Perfume and Booster Gold Cereal. So the character himself incorporates the concept of licensing into his very fabric of what defines him. So doing all this Booster Gold stuff... I mean, you could slap his name on almost anything from a super soaker to a Cabbage Patch Kid, and it works. It's so, it, you know, it, within the context of, you know, a movie or a Booster Gold toy line. So for that reason, and because of the whole, you know, I want to be a star aspect, I think he would be another great toyetic choice to translate from comic book character that's pretty well unknown into a major blockbuster movie. All right, last one, and the big one. A DC property going back to the 1940s called The War That Time Forgot. So this is the story of a group of World War II soldiers who wind up on an island full of dinosaurs. They sort of, uh, sometimes they, it's because they pass through kind of a time portal. Sometimes it's because a time-controlling villain runs the island and brings the dinosaurs there. There's been different iterations of it, and it's been done in modern times, too. So, you know, both the old 1940s comic and, you know, this one is only about 10 years old when they relaunched it. But the concept of bringing in soldiers fighting dinosaurs is the one reoccurring stable element in all of the incarnations. And, wow, when you want to talk about a property that just screams toys, holy cow. You've got not only soldiers, but military vehicles fighting against giant dinosaurs. A T-Rex eating a tank. Can we please see that on the big screen? This property is just one of those kind of hidden gems in the DC Universe arsenal that when translated into you know, a, a live-action movie, or heck, even animation, just works so well. It's basically G.I. Joe versus Jurassic Park so easy to sell. There's your elevator pitch right there. It's G.I. Joe versus Jurassic Park. Bam. Thank you for my green light, Mr. Uh, studio Executive. The, the toys you could make of this, I mean, it's just, not only are you going to be able to make all of the human soldiers in various scales as action figures, and, you know, this whether this is done in three-fourth or six-inch or, you know, even little mini figures that can fit down the dinosaur's gullet, it, doing toy soldier action figures is a very established play pattern. And dinosaurs, again, dinosaur toys, very, very well established play pattern and very well, well selling, one of the best selling toys. I mean, not just Jurassic Park, but dinosaur toys in general. And I'm not talking about, you know, combining dinosaurs and soldiers like into one thing like this. Um, 
you know, we're, we're not talking dinosaur soldiers. We're talking where the dinosaurs are the bad guys and the soldiers are the good guys and they're going to fight like this. I mean, that would make a great toy line and it would translate from movie to toy so well. And I think it would sell really great to kids and collectors alike. It just screams toy. Not only could you do all of the vehicles that can interact with the dinosaurs, but you could do, you know, again, the characters as well. And the characters can fit inside the vehicles or, you know, fit inside the dinosaurs' jaws. We've seen this with Jurassic Park and we've seen this with G.I. Joe, so we know it works. We know that vehicles versus dinosaurs is a great play pattern. Uh, just putting it to a story would be a really great way to continue to bring dinosaur toys to kids in a new and exciting way where they can be fighting against modern man. It's really hard to do cavemen versus dinosaur movies. I mean, you know, like like 10 million BC, the Raquel Welsh film with the Ray uh, Harryhausen effects. Cavemen aren't as aspirational, but soldiers are very aspirational. So kids can see themselves as a soldier fighting a dinosaur. And, you know, as Eric Cartman would say, this is the hidden formula for gold. If you could take two established play patterns, two established toy lines and combine them, you're going to have a hit movie. And ideally, you're then going to have a, a, very, a hit toy line. And it's just going to be this, you know, uh, you know, snake that eats its own tail where it just feeds off itself. The movie's great. The toy line's great. And it just makes young people, old people, middle-aged people, people who are young at heart, just happy. Because toys make people happy. And when you have toys that work really well with a good premise, that is that perfect formula that makes movies more toyetic, where you're not trying to force the toys into the movie. The movie organically generates the toys. And for a lot of studios, this is really moving out of their comfort zone because these properties I've named are very, very uh, unknown by the, by the public. They're really just known by kind of fanboys and you know, super fans. So taking a chance on these properties is definitely a big risk, but, you know, that's where the magic happens. So studio execs, if you're out there, check out my website, spectrocreative.com. This is a big thing that I do. I love working with movie makers, screenwriters, directors to help make movie concepts better for toys. Because, let's face it, that's a lot of times where more of the money comes from, from the toy sales versus the box office. And I love to help develop films with toyetic properties from day one. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, please do subscribe and give it a like. It tells YouTube to share it with other people, and I appreciate it too. But it's always great to share good toy content. Thanks for watching and leave your comments below. I'll be sure to respond.